Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the channel. I'm here with Arnie Trezzi, and we are having an emergency Palantir talk. And uh, I can give a little bit of background. Uh, we had Palantir Weekly, and after Palantir Weekly, sometimes we have an after party with uh, Arnie, and uh, we, we talk behind the background. And um, we both were extremely bullish about uh, Palantir, and then we agreed that we're going to talk about this live on on uh, on on YouTube, and then we woke up this morning and uh, saw the how how much Palantir was going up, and we're like, "Damn it, we have to do this talk before Palantir emergency." Hit. Yeah, <laughs> emergency, emergency. So this is uh, why we are talking about, and it's the reason why this is good and important for the viewer because I think that there's many ways to look at Palantir currently and a lot of people can think that Palantir is overvalued while it's actually quite undervalued in, in our opinion and this is what we want to go over to give you different viewpoints none of this is investment advice this is just our viewpoints with Arnie I was just thinking uh, do, do you recognize that we often end up talking uh, after yeah yeah it's true it's true yeah, I mean, it's it's so interesting when you follow and research a stock as much as as you and me do. You know, you develop kind of a special feeling for the mm -hmm. for the stock. You know, s something that happened, for example, on Rocket Lab uh, with me last week is me and my dad. We have a put option that is going to uh, expire, hopefully worthless in, on on Friday. You know, and. Uh, we started talking about what is the next option that we're going to sell, what price level, what this. And Rocket Lab was having like red day after red day after red day after red day. And then on Friday, I looked at it and I was like, Dad, if this is like probably the last big red day. Let's sell options now, even though the other option hasn't expired yet. And he was like, OK, OK. And I literally like put in the order. And the minute the order went in, it didn't go through. And then the stock has only been going up since. And I was like, damn it. It was <laughs> it literally like, perfect. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was too perfect. But And then you tell me that you can't time the market. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's luck when it happens. Right. And, and, and it's still true because I couldn't time the market because the fucking order didn't go through, you know, the options. But mentally you so... did it. Yeah. Mentally, mentally, mentally we timed the market. So back to our beloved Palantir. Uh, Arnie, I think I can tell you my uh, viewpoint, and I want to see if you resonate with it or you you come at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. So I think that where a lot of people go wrong is that 2022 and 2023 was extreme times. So we got mm -hmm. Palantir down to six dollars, and that was because there was bankruptcy fears. How how it's it sounds ridiculous now, but people thought that this company would never be able to make profit. They thought that this company was a consultancy. Some people still think that this company is an, an AI imposter. But at that time, it was like the market majority was like, we don't know what, what to make of this company, right? And then I think that the increase from 6 to whatever, 16, 18, is like more like a re-rating of like the market realizing like, okay, this is actually a software company. They actually have a gross margin of uh, 80 plus percent. Uh, you know, they are not AI imposters. And now we're more down to the growth. So the people who are buying now, they're not getting an insane deal, but what they're buying is they're buying into a growth company that is growing 30, 20, 20 to 30 to 40 percent. We don't know how much is growing. That's the, that's the, big question mark. So I think if people have the expectation that they're going to buy at 18 now and it's going to be 45 by the end of the year, that's completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And following this logic, I think now I need to share my screen. So again, if we look at the expectations and I'm um, bought into Palantir because I think it's a very long-term uh, grower. And I'm expecting a chart like Apple. You know, it doesn't have to be the steep. You know, Apple is extremely good. But the point is, you know, like every year, 20, 30, 40 percent growth from the from the company. This is what I invested for for the next 10 years. And I'm very happy to be in such a company. And if you look at this chart, uh, you see these pullbacks, you know, that is maybe six months. 
uh, you have one here. You have uh, this is the COVID pullback, which was you know three months. If you if you go earlier, um, I don't know how much you can see my screen. This is almost a year of pullback here, and you know all these pullbacks are like thirty to sixty percent, and all of these ended up being being huge buying opportunities. Mm -hmm. And if you look at our beloved Palantir, th this is one of the things that uh, really piques my interest is that we peaked at 20, uh, almost $22. We are 29% down uh, fr from that point, or we, we were at, at this red day. Uh, and the stock hasn't gone anywhere since uh, May 2023. Like we're in a similar, okay, not counting today. Um. And this makes it to me that this is this Apple-esque, you know, pullback that is a fantastic buying opportunity if you want to be with this growth stock. This, this is one viewpoint. And, and we can, I, I have other bullish arguments, but I, I want to start from here to not make it so long. So what, what is your viewpoint on this? Well, I personally think that uh, we have uh, a distorted distort view of uh, the chart because uh, the chart essentially start uh, with uh, a complete uh, craziness uh, as uh, soon as uh, Panty went listed it became a meme stock so it went uh, like a 2x uh, 3x 4x uh, one day in uh, essentially no time and the the and you were a shareholder Th those are, those of you who are watching Arnie was holding Diamond Hands Palantir during this time? Well, more or less Diamond Hands. Uh, like I initially put uh, 10K in Palantir at the DPO and I found myself having uh, like 40K <laughs> one day and in almost no time I was <laughs> like, whoa, I'm a genius. <laughs> but, <laughs> and uh, but what, was, what was worse, it was uh, that I recognized uh, that, okay, I am aware this company is not worth this much at this moment in time. I was not fully aware of uh, what Palantir really was, how the business was really working. I was, I had uh, enough understanding to say, okay, it is worth uh, this money. I'm already probably putting too much money to work uh, considering how relatively little I understand. Yet uh, it could make sense. The, what was uh, really evil was that uh, that the price above uh, 20 actually stayed there for many months. So it really gave uh, the impression that, okay, this is a basis. And that's the, the biggest fallacy most uh, people can have uh, when uh, they find the comfort in uh, support lines uh, based uh, on very extreme uh, multiples. Because when the situation changes, then uh, all that uh, fake support, mental support, uh, and also in price support uh, becomes uh, broken. And also the trust in what you're doing uh, becomes broken. And then fear star starts uh, triggering in. So essentially we went from uh, neutral at VDPO because it was not an IPO which uh, was pumped by the banks. Actually, it was quite the opposite. Uh, shares became freely available on the market. But, ah, I, di I didn't, I, I didn't get this before. That okay, so so the DPO was basically the the market supply and demand setting the price. It wasn't Wall exactly. Streeters. Wow. Um, okay. Car Carp in uh, one of the earliest uh, earnings calls said, uh, by doing a DPO, we essentially assumed the risk uh, of uh, going bankrupt uh, or essentially like uh, throw the company to to zero. Because uh, yeah, that's when... right. Because if people don't get it and they're not buying, you, you exactly. could you, they they could have opened at two dollars also. Exactly that. So essentially, wow. Carp put the risk, the entire company, at the risk of uh, being uh, acquired for one cent, potentially. Because uh, imagine you had uh, the employees selling a lot of shares, well, uh, at uh, the at the DPO. Because all the shares that were sold were shares that were initially only in the company. It was not a capital raise. So there were no new shares issued on the market. 
Essentially, when a, a they, company goes listed, there are two options. Or the company sells existing shares, meaning existing employees or just shareholders selling shares to the market, or they raise new capital issuing new shares. And Palantir only sold shares, and they sold shares without any guarantee that the um, IPO process, the DPO process would have gone well. Typically, uh, when a company goes IPO, they hire a bank because a bank helps uh, with the roadshow, essentially selling the shares uh, at a high price uh, to asset managers. That's why they make these uh, marketing documents to make the story appealing, uh, to essentially make uh, asset managers, fund managers buy the shares at a high price. And more importantly, for this uh, topic, uh, the banks uh, uh, have uh, a green shoe uh, deal, which implies uh, that the bank uh, assumes uh, a great part of the risk uh, of uh, covering uh, the, the demand of uh, the, the operation, meaning that uh, if the operation doesn't really go well, uh, the bank is impacted. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. it will have to buy some uh, some of these shares. Palantir didn't have uh, this, so essentially by doing the DPO, Carp put the <laughs> the company at a risk uh, of being sold for almost nothing. Yeah, then but now you're now you're making the banks look nice because usually what happens is that they, they get cheaper shares because they're taking the risk, and then the IPO day it opens much higher, and then the bank sells their own shares on the open market and then they make like, I don't know, 20, 30, 40% in a week. Well, my intention was not to make a good light on the banks, <laughs> but okay, more okay. To, to put the light on how much risk it was for Carp being a, a bigger shareholders and for the company to make this. So essentially the DPO, like the initial part, the initial price was a pure offer and demand uh, that was kind of fair, I would say. When the DPO, the um, EV sales, uh, I remember it was uh, 10, which uh, for me as a value investor by, by framework was already an insane number, especially for something that was uh, not only gap negative, but it was also burning cash. So for me, it was like, okay, this is the first and only time I buy a negative free cash flow company <laughs> because uh, I was uh, extremely scared. Then it went uh, to the moon. Okay, fine. Then I did nothing for many months uh, because I saw, okay, it is a, I was already a degenerate to actually buy in at 10. Then the price is uh, in around uh, the 20s. And uh, I just wait until I can, re I can really see, I can, I can really understand that now I'm making a bargain by adding more. And uh, essentially from that uh, caution, that uh, su mental support, of the 20s then we went uh, down to this uh, below 10 at uh, 5 6 uh, and there it was not a neutral price like uh, that was a pure scare pure uh, pure fear like uh, the multiples that were reached there completely made no sense and become the price was not implying bankruptcy but it was implying, implying like, okay, this company will barely grow for the future. Meanwhile, it was free cash flow positive, uh, actually very free cash flow positive. There were problems of all the SPACs, all the SBC, and uh, what happened to them? Like, are you currently scared of the SBC? Are you currently scared of the SPACs? Personally, I mean, I know they're still there, but it's like, uh, I can live with that. But last year, when the price was down, uh, all the press, uh, the, the Wall Street Jordan, the New York Times, or whatever, all the Pantheon Spacks. Uh, okay. Is the company bankrupt? Like, at the end of the day, the worst that happened was uh, Palantir wasted uh, 800 million while producing uh, 500 million per year. You know, Emir on Facebook or Facebook on, on uh, Twitter is saying that it was a good deal and he has his calculations. I, I don't have that. I trust him on his calculations and it looks like they made money on it. Well, it is not really that they made money on it. It is, I would say, 
it is not as bad uh, as it seems. So it is not okay. truly true that Palantir wasted 800 million, but it is true they wasted a lot of <laughs> a lot of money, even considering the benefits of uh, the revenues that actually arrived. I would say there were some uh, good benefits in terms of uh, Palantir being involved uh, into companies uh, with uh, new uh, verticals. It was an experiment <clears throat> also for Palantir to say, okay, you are uh, a weak company. Let's see what happens if uh, we give you a powerful uh, Ferrari. Let's see if you can drive. It is good in terms of understanding new industries, getting more exposure, getting more network from these uh, companies. So there were some benefits and more importantly, in terms of numbers, uh, these SPACs actually paid a lot. To give you a sense of how much these SPACs paid, do you know what's the average uh, revenue per, uh, per client for Palantir, do you remember? Ooh, uh, I remember it's 55 million for the top uh, 20 clients. Uh, I, I get I get something like six million that is coming. Okay, to that's that's exactly right. Okay. What if I tell you and what's the average? Let's put it this way: What's the average size of uh, the customers Palantir has? This in terms this of uh, in terms of market cap, like I mean, are aren't aren't all of them like this global two thousand companies? Exactly that. Like I don't care the specific size or revenue. Like. We know that the average company Palantir serves uh, is actually a big company, a multinational yeah. blue chip uh, company on average. Then there are also smaller companies like Beyond Meat uh, and stuff like that. But on average, uh, Palantir serves uh, very big corporations. And we can see that from uh, the, the nice charts uh, with all the logos, with AAP Con, Foundry Con, like the average customer tend to be very big. Do you know how much each SPAC were contributing at that time? Uh, this, I don't know. This, I don't know. $8 million. Whoa. No okay. wonder they all went bankrupt. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so it was an extremely risky bet for Palantir in terms of capital, but uh, a great part of this risky capital was compensated uh, by these relatively obscene revenue Palantir was getting from these packs. So overall, I would say it was a bad bet for the output, but uh, there were some reasoning behind it that uh, made it a bet that maybe it was worth taking. So we can judge more on, uh, okay, they made this bet that just didn't go well. But uh, given the high, very, very high revenue they were getting, it was uh, worth taking the bet. If they only deployed the capital without uh, not without getting those revenues, that would have been a very bad bet. With revenues, I would say it was not that a bad bet. It was more a bet with a bad outcome. But we, we still get the consequences of that. We Because SPACs contributed uh, having uh, the stock price very high back then. And I think there was also a component that when the stock is high, maybe the management uh, wanted to give reasons to sustain the valuation and they were incentivized to, okay, let's make this to actually sustain <laughs> the growth uh, so that we can also sustain the price. Maybe, I, I don't know about this. Uh, maybe that was uh, a reasoning that uh, support the, the SPACs. Uh, but uh, with uh, SPACs gradually being uh, hit in terms of business, being for them uh, not a growth contribution, but actually a decline in revenues because uh, for these SPACs, uh, paying $8 million was uh, expensive. Most of these SPACs uh, actually failed. Then we started having a negative contribution aligned with a general decline. So... So now, what about the SPACs? Like, uh, they're still there, but they still contribute uh, negatively. And I think uh, this year, so 2024, will be the year where SPACs uh, essentially we start uh, to gradually impact uh, so, 10 to zero. So, 
so just for the viewers, so what you mean by them uh, contributing negatively is that in 2022, uh, they made a, an, an inorganic bump in the revenue. And then in 2023, you're comparing the numbers to 2022. And then mm -hmm. your numbers look a lot worse because you, you have the, like you're comparing against inorganic numbers that, that they got from the specs. Correct. Yeah. While in 2024, we will make the comparison with 2023 numbers, which are very close to zero. So the overall contribution of this pack uh, will uh, be not uh, that detrimental because of the negative effect has already been digested last year. As a matter of fact, we also de we delivered a relatively very bad revenue growth. But I would say now things uh, change completely already from last year. But as we were talking uh, in these last uh, six months, I think we can really say how good YouTubers uh, would say everything changed. Yeah. <laughs> no clickbait. Everything changed. Yeah. Emergency meeting. Everything changed. Exactly. Exactly. So what, what makes you bullish in... in uh... In this, uh, yeah. Well, so, so why answer... why now why now and not six months ago when the price was at sixteen? Look, uh, I was heavily criticized uh, for uh, having uh, reduced uh, my Palantir position, and uh, partly for good reasons because I reduced uh, a part uh, at uh, thirteen. But then I also reduced uh, when uh, the price uh, was uh, spiking, so I made some reduction at uh, seventeen, some at twenty. So. Yes, uh, I made um, a mistake at 13, but overall, I don't feel it was a real mistake uh, because uh, what we were uh, seeing uh, were the price mooning and to say probably too much too fast. And that was backed uh, a combination by Palantir becoming up profitable and uh, also starting to being attached uh, to the AI theme, the AI label. And for these reasons, uh, the stock uh, were just following the flows of AI stocks, uh, which received uh, a lot of uh, interest or, or hype. The big problem I had uh, was that uh, until we really saw a shift, it was the stock which was mooning and the business didn't really give any signs of, wait a second, everything is changing now. So. Essentially, what you really want to see when the stock uh, goes uh, to, to the moon is also the business going uh, to the moon. Because you don't want, as an investor, having the stock to grow too, mu too much and the business basically staying uh, flat or growing uh, relatively too little compared uh, with the price. Because that really creates uh, a downside risk. But then, before the summer, it was uh, around uh, May. Two things, uh, in my opinion, really changed uh, changed everything. Like the first one was uh, the contract for the reconstruction of Ukraine. This deal that, in my opinion, is relatively underspoken. Uh, uh, that to me, it was a crazy signal hinting that uh, not only what Palantir does in Ukraine has been recognized, but also that from the eyes of uh, Ukrainians, is not only software for free, <laughs> but uh, they really see um, an evolution of the partnership with Palantir. Because the big problem we had so far well, as investors were, okay, we have intuition Palantir could be involved in the war in Ukraine. Then this speculation became supported by some hints. Then the management said explicitly, okay, we are helping Ukraine. Then also journals started to recognize, hey, Palantir is helping in Ukraine. But the contribution that all of these actually had on the business was neither zero, was below zero, <laughs> because uh, Palantir was uh, providing the software for free, meaning that yeah. at the end of the day, it was a cost for Palantir, neither, yeah. <laughs> neither a break-even thing, okay? So having this deal of uh, Ukraine to my eyes meant, uh, okay, there is uh, a, um, 
a project that eventually will get Palantir revenues and actually big revenues. Imagine how much important it is uh, for a company like Palantir to reconstruct completely the data infrastructure of a country. And uh, Ukraine, okay, is not uh, the richest country in the world, but uh, it is a big country. And uh, if uh, the war ends, you have actually BlackRock money along with all the Davos <laughs> money. Yeah, I, I was going to say, it's not Ukraine paying for this. It's uh, supporting yeah. uh, that. So that is a, a place uh, as an investor where you want to be also for the idea of helping Ukraine. But now we are, cynic we are talking as cynical investors. So that to me was a huge signal. Okay, the, like this deal alone signals that uh, Ukraine is recognizing the value and they're really willing uh, to support a big transformational project, which uh, once the, the war ends, uh, potentially could be a, a role model for the entire Europe or the world. Probably what we were, we will see with Ukraine, the uh, sorry, with uh, England and the NHS. Over time, if uh, the UK NHS actually keeps delivering value, it will become a role model for how the health system should uh, be run. And the second thing was uh, AAP. So during that time, uh, ChatGPT broke out. Okay, fine. And uh, we all knew that somehow Palantir would have benefited from this AI wave. Like even before AAP was introduced, uh, we, already, we were already speculating that Palantir would have been probably more involved into the AI structure, infrastructure theme rather than, okay, Palantir developing a model because that's the idea behind the, the company. And uh, with AAP, first, uh, I didn't understand exactly what it was, but uh, once we started uh, grasping, okay, this stuff is actually a tool to orchestrate LLM models. It seems actually superior than just running uh, a model. And then when they changed the go-to-market to fully exploit this platform, it was like, wait a second, in no time, they delivered another product. This product seems not only revolutionary, but seems actually something that really matches what people are interested in, differently from Apollo. Like Apollo, we know that is extremely valuable, but at this moment in time, essentially nobody gives a shit of uh, Apollo. Yeah, we know yeah. it's valuable, we know it's there, but uh, the in general interest is not on uh, software delivery platforms. Yeah, yeah. They will be, but uh, not right now. With AAP, we could have a sense of companies want this right now. And with bootcamps, essentially, they, they completely switched their go-to-market strategy from six months, two months, uh, to two days, three days. Like, this is a simple thing alone changes everything. And now it has not only changed everything, but we already have like six months of Palantir running AAP almost every day. Yeah. So many yeah. boot camps. I, I need, don't remember I, the, the number, but it was like a, in, the thou, in the hundreds. Uh, yeah, I think soon in the thousands. So, it's many, many hundreds. I think it's like six, 600 now, last year, something like this. So if we consider that uh, six months ago, the price was expensive because uh, we had uh, the stock going up, but there were no real substance on the business side. Now we are in the opposite position. The stock has uh, gone down relatively from uh, uh, six months ago, like down 10% or so, but the business has shifted completely. Like we are gap profitable for four months. So we are just a tiny step be before the S&P 500 inclusion. The growth has accelerated and is expected to keep accelerating. So it's not as speculating, oh, growth should reaccelerate. We already have more than one hint that the growth is accelerating. And now let's connect with the SPAC thing the SPACs should gradually impact less and less. And now we have the management 
that is essentially bragging <laughs> around <laughs> with uh, Shiam participating to podcast, being super energetic, super smiley. Calm, he looked uh, like he looked like he came from a freaking vacation. He was he didn't sound like Chat GPT. That guy, he's like he's like the KLLM when he speaks at you know <laughs> Palantir. He looks like he's like created by AIP. You know they're like. AIP create an avatar for Palantir and AIP created Shyam Sankar. So he, he wasn't like that. He was a human from this planet and, you know, speaking with Tom Nash. And how good does the company have to go if your top executive looks like he came from a vacation? While in reality, he went uh, all around the world <laughs> because uh, essentially ju just after that, uh, he went to a conference uh, uh to talk about defense uh, summit uh, so so it, these are actually tough weeks uh, for all of them but uh, both uh, shim and and the uh, carp look so proud so secure of themselves yeah we went and together. they have they have never let us down like wh when carp has said you know like whenever he made these outlandish uh, statements that you know we have so many customers we have so much this so much that it was always true. He he has never done the mask, you know, like we will have FSD this year. It's like when he said we will be gap profitable, they were gap, pro gap profitable. You know, when he said that there's like unprecedented demand, there was unprecedented demand. So there there is no reason to think that it's not the case now. You know, I think this is part of the asymmetry because for someone who has never studied the CARP and Palantir before, if you look at a CEO, a crazy, a batshit crazy CEO like that, saying these uh, batshit crazy things, you would say intuitively, oh, guys, this is a scammer, or oh, this is a, a SBF 2.0, as many people yeah, call yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on X. Yeah. And I can understand why people say that, apart yeah. from the hair. But if you actually know Carp enough, you have been following him. Uh, for quite long enough, you understand that I actually behind those crazy, crazy things, those crazy things are not crazy. When Carp says something is because he cre really believes or see them. Yeah. Now, if I think of this history of three years of Carpness, the only thing I saw him missing was uh, the 30% Kager he initial, initially hinted for. Probably he made a mistake saying something like uh, a 30% every single year, or if he didn't but, but say you know, the precise words, uh, he hinted for those. But, but, but you know, on, on, on this one, it's so easy to give them a pass because as a company, like... Like you, you make projections, everybody understands that they're projections. And when you're so far into the future, like how do you see COVID coming? How do you see, uh, you know, the inflation going up? How do you see like all these things that was once in a hundred year events uh, that happened? So uh, it's that that is a point that you have there. But I don't know, I, I myself give him a pass on that. There's so many other companies that have guided uh, for similar and then it was completely missed. Well, Palantir missed quite heavily on uh, those expectations that people started uh, to, to have. I think uh, it is fair to recognize. But at the end of the day, even in the worst conditions ever for them last year, they actually grew. So every single quarter, they advanced. Some quarters more, some quarters less. But more importantly, while decelerating, they were able to actually cut costs to a point uh, where they completely change uh, their business plan. Probably they were thinking of uh, we go thirty per we, we grow thirty percent by growing thirty percent. Uh, naturally, we reach a certain scale that help us uh, reach a profit profitability in a couple of years. Uh, more precisely, in two thousand twenty-five. That was actually what uh, I estimated. Uh, two years ago when uh, I wrote one of my first articles by making some very broad assumptions. I thought, okay, probably 2025 will be the year where we break even. 
But the reality was uh, when uh, the reality changes, you need to adapt. And uh, I would say they adapt uh, very well because uh, not only they became gap profitable very, very earlier, but meanwhile, they also developed new product with uh, like uh, Apollo, but more importantly, AAP. So think of this, like while they were cutting costs, they developed a new product that disrupted completely how they operate and actually that helped them save a, an insane amount of uh, uh, cost. Because what we are seeing right now is that the company is growing more while saving costs. So I was just going to say that they're cutting costs and re-accelerating growth. And that's something that you don't like see. This information, like typically in a company like uh, Salesforce, uh, S- uh, Snowflake and so on, what you see is uh, the more money you put into growth, the more you grow. You stop uh, putting money to, to grow, you grow less. And, and you have to say that that's because usually these, these, uh, this money goes into, you know, Facebook ads, Google ads, you know, PR events, and, and obviously you have a conversion rate. Uh, so if you put your product in front of more people, you will have more conversions. And in the ZERP era, like the zero interest rates uh, period, when you had growth at all costs, then the VCs or, you know, the, the investors, they didn't care how much money you lost. It was like, are you showing growth? And any company can grow if you're just pumping money into, you know, Facebook ads and Google ads. And and uh, yeah, so it, it, it Palantir is not doing any of that. They have a pretty bad sales team as far as we understand. Like that's not the strength of the company. And they were cutting money and reaccelerating the growth. So that's that's very remarkable. I mean, the, uh, maybe it's not the perfect picture to represent this, but I think uh, while uh, you are driving, the more you press on the gas, the faster you go, okay? Yeah. And the more you consume. Yeah. That's the cost of uh, Yeah, it's a, it's going a good. Past. I see where you're going. Okay. It's, I see where okay. you're going. It's, it's what good. Palantir yeah. essentially is doing is uh, the more it press the gas, the more it accelerates, but meanwhile, rather than consuming more, it consumes less. They it's break like, the laws of physics. Exactly this. Like yeah. this sounds, uh, oh yes, they were, they have been good. No, 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 no. Like if this is true, and actually, okay, it is true, but it is uh, replicable. That is something that uh, is behind the surface that keeps working for uh, not just one quarter, two quarters, but we see like this structure being part of the structure of the business, this thing alone hints uh, that uh, it's like they are distorting uh, the laws of uh, the economics, meaning that uh, they cracked the code uh, to deliver superior profitability. Do you know, as uh, value investors, one of the key concepts is uh, the return on invested capital. Now, There are many ways uh, to actually look at uh, this idea, but uh, the core idea is uh, you need to look how much the company makes compared with the money you put into inside the company. So then uh, you can look uh, more precisely of only the equity part uh, or the component of equity plus the debt or minus the cash if you actually have net cash. But the core idea is uh, a company, in order to grow, theoretically, should put more capital to work. The more capital you put to work, the more you grow. And there is always this uh, thin balance between understanding uh, how much to push the growth, how much this growth should come from revenue growth, uh, from asset uh, optimization, from the margins expanding. Okay. So this is uh, the DuPont uh, analysis called uh, essentially understanding how the value in your company is generated. But that's the core idea. The more money you put, the more you grow. And the companies that have a superior return over time in terms of stock price are those companies that have a high return on the investments, typically. Yeah, on, on equity. 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. when you are actually growing much at a relatively low cost, it means that you have a high return on invested capital. But if you actually grow more while spending less, that essentially means that you are <laughs> at infinite return on capital. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, because you're taking money out of the equation, yet you're still growing. Like you're, exactly, you're, you're yeah, you're having like on the negative money, you're having a plus return. Yeah. So obviously, this is a software business. So in the software world, uh, this is uh, possible, but it's not a guarantee that happens. Actually, it is very difficult to to achieve. When you are able to do that, it essentially means uh, that you grow without putting more money to work. And why this magic happens? Because Palantir, rather than acquiring companies, <laughs> rather than throwing money into sub-level sub employees, they kept hiring very top 1% employees. They built uh, this platform for 20 years. And with uh, this tiny, shiny platform, they can build uh, new solutions in very little time, solutions that work and solutions that can change dramatically the, the destiny of companies, including Palantir itself. So Palantir AAP was developed in record time. It started changing the, the business of Palantir itself because uh, imagine all the internal software employees uh, so, and software engineers becoming extremely more more efficient in uh, writing code, uh, managing tasks, uh, cutting uh, inefficient uh, times, then you can expand that to also the customers. And you can do that with uh, a two months pilot, a uh, two, uh, two days pilot rather than six month pilot. So AAP is essentially the key to unlock uh, infinite return on capital. Now, yeah. now it is only a matter of selling it. Yeah, and, and I just want to add, if I might, uh, that part of the reason what adds to the asymmetry is that Wall Street doesn't think with this until they can see the return on paper. So until there is a quarterly report where they say that the conversion rate of AIP is blah, we're charging this many dollars to the customers that come after and we are expecting blah, blah number of customers, like the Wall Street analysts don't think with this like for them it doesn't exist and they think this is a crazy venture uh, carp has no pricing strategy and you know he's he's betting the whole company on this and like you mentioned you can see how confident shyam and and uh, carp is but you can also see the customers that have gone to uh, aips you see their videos you, you you start to see crazy stories and you start at prs coming out of the company of quite nice and big contracts that came from AIPs in no time. So, so it's like you, you have it confirmed three ways how well the strategy is, is going. And yet I don't think that the street gives it any value. No, because uh, the street uh, takes uh, everything uh, as uh, a fact only when it starts entering the Bloomberg terminal. Analysts don't spend time on YouTube searching for hints like we do. They don't, uh, they don't think there is value into following Vince and Arnie on X and on live streams, but uh, I heavily encourage you do. The link's below. <laughs> <laughs> but um, these are actually true valuable information. Uh, I connected with um, a comment I saw from uh, Bine, hope I spell it well, mentioning uh, Shiam on the Palantir Weekly. Sorry, uh, Shiam uh, interview uh, with uh, Tom Nash. Shiam said something uh, that was really important that uh, matches perfectly what we were discussing previously about the return on investment. Analysts look at the rate of change. A rate of change, uh, once uh, it has already happened, it enters uh, the Bloomberg terminal. So once they see a press release of uh, the growth uh, accelerating, now they can write a report, oh, the growth is accelerating. I would say, yes, buongiorno Fiorellino. It's like, uh, and then the stock has already moved, so too late. <laughs> 
we need to be captive in not seeing the things afterwards. So once the first derivative has happened, so the change, but we need to be very captive. And that's what we like to share here at Palantir Bullets on X to the hints that the second order derivative is actually increasing. The second order derivative is how fast the rate of change changes. In other words, what are the hints that the acceleration is real? Because if we can spot these hints, like a Palantir making 600 boot camps and the market still not really realizing, oh, wait a second, 600 boot camps in six months means essentially more than 1,200 boot camps in a year if uh, you keep having the same employees. But uh, over time, Palantir can become even more proficient in making boot camps. So potentially, they can double the amount of uh, boot camps or organizations involved in the boot camps. So you start making this kind of reasoning that uh, gives you a sense of, wait a second, this is not a one-off. This is a structure that is evolving. It is improving. It is accelerating. Therefore, the rate of change of a rate of change is actually increasing. If this is true and we're not talking bullshit, this has profound implications in the growth. Maybe not the growth of the next quarter, but on the direction of the growth. So what I see right now as a big asymmetry is that uh, the market sees uh, Palantir growing, uh, and we can see that from the uh, consensus estimates, Palantir growing around 20% until 2025. Fixed. 20% CAGR each year, while 20% is the growth that Palantir has already been estimated for this quarter. And I personally see there are, there are enough hints at this point, with also Carp saying we have unprecedented demand and blah, 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 that uh, this 20% growth is the baseline, not the floor. Yeah. So if this is true, that... Uh, this 20% is the floor and not, sorry, is the, sorry, the floor and not the roof. It means uh, that uh, the price at this point has relatively less downside than the upside. What I call a convex situation, a symmetry or, <laughs> or uh, how we prefer. And uh, I believe uh, there, is, there will be like a, a very nice uh, convergence. <laughs> what I think is a tsunami happening between the interest of AI merging the interest in the government in defense uh, spending, defense tech driven by Ukraine, by Israel, and uh, governments waking up of uh, how they can solve uh, a lot of issues in terms of budget issues by deploying AI. Because I, I think a topic that we haven't... Uh, really mentioned uh, yet at the Palantir Weekly, but also on X round, is uh, something that I learned uh, by studying some uh, asset managers operating in the alternative asset manager space, meaning uh, uh, infrastructure funds, uh, private funds, uh, private, pri pri private equity and private credit funds. Uh, a re recurring theme is the fact that uh, Governments are so in depth, in depth right now that uh, they need these external companies to actually deploy capital that the government can't really spend because they are already too much levered. If is, this is true that the, the governments are, are too much levered, it means that they really need to seek efficiency. So if they see some uh, very good cases from, uh, let's say, the NHS England, unlocking uh, a huge amount of saving and efficiency, and then they start expanding these to other parts of the government, then you would see a rush also from the government to actually deploy these uh, technologies, to actually change uh, these uh, tiny percentages that move very big uh, numbers. Yeah. Essentially, pa what I see right now is uh, the stock... Uh, sees uh, Palantir going uh, as a river, but in reality, it is emerging as a tsunami. Yeah. Yeah, I, I 
see it in a very similar way. We have had the stock go sideways where like before we had the stock go up and the company not really execute. And now we have the opposite, like the stock going sideways for like six, seven months with the company executing like crazy. Uh, and an another thing, which is also a future hint, you know, I, I don't know. I, I most probably have picked up on the same thing, but Palantir is starting to be monopolistic in some of the industries that they're in. So, for example, you uh, take Skywise and in the Shyam interview, uh, he said 66% of the world's airplanes are run on Skywise and maintained with, with Skywise, right? And Palantir went into healthcare and you see the same thing there that they're spreading like crazy. And I think very soon they will have a monopolistic situation also in healthcare. And I think that there will be many industries uh coming in the future where they will just get the foot in the door and then they will be a monopoly there mm -hmm. i think this is a very underrated uh, aspect as you mentioned uh, healthcare and aviation are the two verticals where we start seeing uh, real impact uh, for instance the nhs uh, disclosed uh, last week uh, that they, re they achieved uh, a record uh, in uh, how many people were uh, were managed as uh, as patient but we also know that uh, a company everybody knows uh, is having uh, big uh, problems with uh, its planes and i'm talking about uh, boeing essentially the arch rival of uh, the palantir support <laughs> the airbus had uh, another problem with their 737 MAX plane, which was already a plane that had a lot of issues years ago. And now there were another issue that uh, became uh, viral. The big problem here is that uh, while a software can't really adjust a bolt, <laughs> a software like uh, what Palantir has developed with Airbus can help prevent these situations to actually emerge. Because uh, during a flight, I read uh, a plane collects uh, 2 million data. And all this data is uh, collected by sensors and then processed uh, by Skywise. By processing all this data, Skywise helps uh, air, um, air, airlines uh, companies to actually be sure that each plane is uh, perfectly in line or if there is some... Uh, cases that need to be monitored, they can have uh, some hints uh, of, wait a second, this plane, uh, the next time it goes to this airport, make it have a look at that, because this situation could generate an anomaly. But how you can uh, know that? You need to have the sensors, you need to have all these sensors actually speaking to a like a one complete picture, which we can call it ontology, and then with that, uh, you can say, wait a second, this is an anomaly. Let's check this anomaly before it becomes a problem. But if you wait uh, until the problem becomes an issue, then you start having uh, planes on the ground. You can start uh, having uh, repercussions also on uh, your business because uh, this lost interest on the Boeing 737 actually means uh, losing potential deals uh, or Maybe it's already too late against uh, Airbus. Can you can you share the screen, uh, please? Here you go. Like uh, this is a, a chart that uh, triggered uh, many people <laughs> last week because uh, I, I shared this uh, this chart saying, uh, "Look, Palantir is the difference between winning and losing." <laughs> With uh, the total return chart of Airbus against Boeing since uh, Palantir started working with uh, Airbus. And Airbus uh, is not a random company, is uh, th probably the client that has been uh, palantirized, palantirized, palantirized <laughs> more, who have been worked uh, for- The biggest palantards. <laughs> they are the biggest palantards, indeed. Uh, started working in 2015. So they actually worked a lot with, uh, with Palantir, and uh, since the problems Boeing is having, 
they essentially keep reiterating mistakes and uh, meanwhile Airbus is benefiting in terms of business which then is reflected into stock price so my speculation is that what we have we can see here as an output of many variables meaning that uh, Airbus is now making better money than Boeing. Boeing is having troubles in the operations, but that comes from a cultural uh, idiocy that make them not spend on the right things. They were outsourcing software development for eight, nine dollars. <laughs> so imagine the software of the Boeing were developed uh, by outsourced uh, software developers for nine dollars per hour. That's the culture they had. Meanwhile, Airbus was spending 100 million per year on, on uh, making Skywise. Yeah. So this chart seems, uh, oh, Arnie, you can't compare this stuff. But once you understand uh, what's behind this chart, you realize that is not uh, a random correlation. And I personally think uh, we will see this, but replicated, as you mentioned, into healthcare, and then gradually also on other business, other verticals over time, uh, multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. One very interesting thing in, in closing that uh, I want to ask your opinion on is I feel that in some ways it was easier to buy Palantir when it was at $6 because the valuation was so ridiculous that, you know, it, it was like if you could overcome the emotions, uh, it was it was an easy buy. And I feel that usually what happens to the stocks that are doing great is you start to have these clickbait titles that are coming from, uh, it can even come from bulls sometimes. Uh, for example, Apple, every year when the iPhone comes out, it's like, oh, the demand is not there. They cancel the orders. And then, you know, after two months, they're like, oh, sorry, we, we completely missed. Uh, we spoke to the wrong suppliers or something, you know? Same with Tesla. It's like, oh, they will not have demand for the Model 3. Oh, they will not have model for demand for the Model Y. Oh, this will not happen. And I feel that Palantir is becoming into this era uh, where you you will like you, you you will start getting these BS articles. You will start getting this FOMO. The FOMO machine is going to start about the company, and it's going to be, oh, there's new competitors that are coming. They're going to you know kill the product in two months. Or, you know, there's no demand for their company, like, for this. The, the government is slowing canceled. down. Exactly. Exactly. We actually, that that came today. We, did, we didn't talk about it, but there there is something about it today. I didn't have time to go into it, maybe. And, and we're quite long into the thing. So maybe, maybe it's another uh, podcast. But I think that... Uh, one shouldn't worry. I think it's a natural thing when you when you hold a company and the company that has been able to build out such a big moat and it took you know tens of years to develop this product and you see how agile management is that they're able to uh, you know develop products on a dime. I don't think that they will there will be a competitor who comes and in two months completely overthrows uh, the company. So my worry level is zero. And uh, what, what do you think about this topic? I would agree that depending on your investing style, Palantir was an easier buy at uh, the, um, the, that the price is below 10. But uh, it was like the valuation per se was a, a screaming buy, but uh, pulling the trigger there, was not that easy because the sentiment uh, was extremely bad. Essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. or you were just, uh, uh, how can I say, a uh, non-interested person. You just saw, okay, come on, <laughs> what's this price? Uh, I know Palantir is not that a bad company. Let's put a chip here and let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you were that, but if, if you were involved, into what was uh, going around back then the sentiment was not bad it was very 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 bad like i was even said by a guy called buyback capital oh this is mental illness 
<laughs> I, I wanted to scream out because, uh, well, certain things uh, I would avoid uh, telling, especially when it uh, turned out uh, we were not mental ill. But it's a mental illness, but not from our part. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, it was it was tough from a sentiment uh, point of view. Yet uh, the valuation was a screaming buy. Right now, the sentiment is very different because uh, it is not bad. The stock went uh, relatively down, much much down, without uh, nothing really happening. Like think this way. Since uh, we were at 21, the NHS deal happened. That, is, <laughs> that was like the biggest milestone. Meanwhile, uh, we got uh, the Unicredit deal. We got uh, a lot of confirmations from uh, AAP Con. We got uh, a lot of uh, further deals uh, in the healthcare space. So what we have been seeing exactly right now is uh, the stock being relatively down a lot, but there is this general feeling of, uh, oh, now the stock is expensive because we are still anchored to the fact that it was expensive at the same price uh, six yeah. months ago. So Very well when, said. so I, I think the risk now is uh, having anchored uh, expectations in mind. I, I think personally think uh, we made uh, a good job uh, trying to make people realize uh, that uh, evaluation is not a static number. It's not a target price, that, uh, that's it. But as uh, the situation evolves, uh, also the parameters with which uh, you analyze things need to evolve. So while Palantir six months ago in my opinion, and I can say, in our opinion, was not really deserving much more than it was. After these six months and after this evolution that uh, we discussed, mainly driven by AAP, which is uh, growing so fast in the US uh, that we need to rebuild the company. Yeah. At this point, these 70, say 17, 16 dollars. I would say they're not expensive. I would not call it, uh, oh, this is the deal of the decade. It could be, but is not uh, true on a numer numerical standpoint. Right now, is uh, I, I I'm confident in saying uh, I don't see it as expensive. I would not call it, oh, now it's cheap, now I need to... <laughs> to yeah, I, I mean, it's. I, I think that for the people who didn't buy it at six and they want an AI exposure, they're new to this company, they wanted to build a position. I think our point is now is a relatively risk-free time to buy it. We don't know if it's going to go up or, or down, but I also feel that the, the sentiment about the stock is not that positive. The stock is 30% down and all the signs that we see and we are looking at is showing that the company is doing much better than people think. So. I think that even if we go to the earnings now and it shits the bed, the stock will not really go down from here because it, it was already people somehow are expecting that it will shit the bed. And on the other hand, if we believe our eyes and, and you know that's, that's the version that will play out, we might see another leg up to this rally. And maybe this company in a year reaches the 60 billion that Mr. Clark was speaking about or you know like starts mm -hmm. going that way and then it was a fantastic buy uh, okay. a couple of considerations uh, mm, peter thiel said uh, when things go bad people tend to be over pessimistic when things uh, go well they tend to understate uh, how well <laughs> they are going i personally think we are in this phase also, given the fact that uh, if you think of it, we are essentially at the same price before the Q3 results, which were very good. And uh, now they should be even better. Yeah. Also considering uh, the compounding effect uh, of uh, this speed that is increasing. So could, could it drop? Absolutely, yes. 
But uh, let's make this a thought experiment. What happens if the business actually keeps uh, evolving in the right direction where entering the S&P 500 uh, with a very, very high percentage uh, probability in uh, March, okay? And uh, the stock goes down uh, to 14. Like, how much money just waiting to buy that 14 that is around? Obviously, here we are in the speculative territory, but I personally think uh, there are so many people screaming, oh, it's expensive here and there, that already you can see we can go at, at a technical level. Like, we are not technical analysts, but... Uh, Sometimes a technical anal analysis can give some hints. We are that close. Let me put the chart in. So let, let yeah, I, I have it. I was just going to, or yeah, maybe you put it. Then, then uh, you can ease more easily. Do you have my screen? Okay, here we are. Um... So by the way, Midwest Cannabis is asking while we're waiting for you. What do you guys think about a nineteen dollar covered calls that is expiring this Friday? Am I safe? <laughs> no, I mean, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean we don't give investment advice here, uh, but I don't know. Maybe if I had nineteen dollar cover calls, maybe I would roll them up to a, a higher. But I, I don't know where the stock is going to go in the in the short term. I'm not the person to ask about cover calls because. Uh... I made the last year my first year of experiment with covered calls with an account having only Palantir. And the Palantir went up uh, like 140%. Uh, and my account uh, with call options went uh, up uh, only 100%. So it means I essentially completely waste a 40% gain rather than making <laughs> an additional gain with, uh, with options. So, so far, I, I am not entitled to say anything about <laughs> call options. Yeah, you, you, you know, I, I covered calls I'm very uh, careful with because for me, if the, if my stocks would be called away, it would be a catastrophe tax-wise because exactly then I have to that. pay all the taxes. And and uh, I, I much more like selling puts, you know, because uh, and, and especially if you can do it uh, at the price that you would anyways buy it and you would have you have a margin on your account because then you are sort of making money on the bank's money and the worst thing that happens is like for example on pound here if i would sell puts maybe i would sell at 14 dollars as the the one that that you said and the worst thing that happens is like the bank's margin makes you buy uh pound here at 14 dollars and then you have to fill up the account and honestly that i i would be happy to be like buying pound here at 14, it, it's a win-win, you know? And if it doesn't go, like if the stock shoots up, then you just keep the the premium and it was the bank's money anyways. Like you, yeah, but that's that's me. I, I agree. That's why on I'm learning the covered calls in a smaller account uh, because I need to, to be in a position to actually make these uh, mistakes because uh, the tax implications of being called away on some shares that you don't want to be called that way because you want yeah, I mean, to have them compounded. I mean, look, look, 80, no, at, at that time, I mean, now my portfolio is, uh, I actually don't know, it's probably 50 50 Rocket Lab and Pound here. And I would have so much taxes on, on Pound here. My average is eight. And so if on the covered call, if they would be called away, I would have a crap ton of taxes and I would have to buy back Pound here at a higher price. So all I would do to myself is basically shoot <laughs> myself taxes. in the balls, pay taxes and have much less shares. Like it, I, I just can't, I just can't think with it. Probably you will pay more taxes uh, than the premiums you would get. Yeah, way the... more, way more, way more. <laughs> like it's not even. But yeah. on the technical side, our very profound technical analyst, Vincent Arni. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, don't want to admit themselves, but uh, they both were born as uh, traders. <laughs> we can see this uh, huge gap uh, from uh, $14.99 to, that is still open despite uh, Palantir approached uh, the 200 uh, moving average uh, that went very close uh, to, uh, to the $15. But there is uh, this uh, gap that is still not closed. Uh, so until this gap, uh, very big gap, uh, doesn't get closed, uh, 
a lot of people will be there. Oh, at 15, I buy because uh, at uh, 15, 50 is not good enough. That's the, the potential risk. And I think uh, this is what uh, many, many people are waiting for because theory or uh, I would say legends say gaps uh, get filled. And I say in general, that is uh, actually true that most gaps uh, get filled and then the stocks uh, go in the other direction. However, there are uh, unfortunate situations like this gap, this very huge, nice gap from when Palantir became profitable and then started attracting very big money is a gap that, uh, in my opinion, would never be filled. Or unless the economy goes completely uh, crazy in a bad sign or Palantir starts having very big several issues, it is very hard that this gap will get filled. So while uh, in general, you, we can see, for instance, uh, here the gap got filled, this gap uh, got filled and then down. Well, there is this gap that didn't got filled. But in general, gaps will get filled. So I personally think uh, at this point, uh, there are so many people waiting for this gap to get closed uh, that it is highly unlikely it will get closed because uh, everyone is waiting for that. And uh, I speculate and I underscore, this is pure speculation. What happened to you to Rocket Lab uh, would happen to many people. Waiting for, oh, no, 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 because I don't buy at uh, 15, 20, because uh, it is, the gap is not closed. You, you know, but... my, my favorite example is Matt Money, uh, the, the, my fellow co-host on Rocket Lab Weekly. He didn't buy Tesla. His target price was 350 before the splits, you know, in the, in the COVID dip. And the price went down to 350.60. So because of those 60 cents, he didn't buy Tesla. And he missed out like on a 10x or 7x or something uh, like this. That's hard. <laughs> well, that's even worse than me. Like, uh, let's go on the mistakes of Arnie. Do you see this, this day when Palantir was at 592? Okay. I had uh, the order at 555 or 560. <laughs> okay. And I was, no, 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 no. 591, 92. No way, 590? No, 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 that's too expensive. I want 555 or 560. Ouch, ouch, ouch. That, that, that was, that was your, I, those cents were the most expensive cents of I, your, of your I life. was ready to deploy like 20% uh, straight cash. Like uh, I was 80% Palantir and 20% cash. That cents uh, cost me essentially like uh, uh, 24 percent further of the portfolio because that 20 percent would have doubled ouch, ouch. So, so guys so this to say like to to get a bottom line <laughs> of uh, all these uh, technical uh, aspects uh, is uh, true there are uh, some things that uh, tend to be recurring like uh, gaps get filled and so on but it is really important to understand uh, the context and i personally believe uh, right now that there is a very high demand for a tool like Palantir. So there yeah. is the company, but there is the stock. And we need to think of the stock as a tool that gives exposures to investors that want to have that kind of exposure. So far, Palantir is the only company that is pure AI, that is also gap profitable, and it will enter in the S&P 500 in a matter of months. So I believe... And here I, I it, would, I, it's, it's so valuable. funny. I, I just want to say, I think Palantir might be the only AI company that actually brings value to the marketplace. It, it was mentioned in uh, the All In podcast that, you know, Chat GPT is actually, it doesn't give you so much value as, as you think. Like it doesn't create new value. And Palantir is. I, I would say the only AI company that I know that actually, like we, we had this, that Palantir probably charges 10% of the value that they create. Mm -hmm. So them having a 2 billion revenue means that they have created 20 billion, that's with the B, value in the real world. And I don't know of any other AI company that, that does that and is not a party trick. 
that's true. Like, uh, that's the reason why so far you see people saying, oh, we got our people being uh, 50% more efficient. Okay, give me the output. Like, uh, so far, we don't really have any evidence from any company of uh, real business value unlocked with AI. At most, uh, we see people claiming uh, they are more efficient, and I believe uh, that is true. But how that actually translated into real business value? Like uh, how many more planes uh, have you actually built? How mm, much water have you actually saved? How many beds in hospital were you able to manage more? How many soldiers did you bring home alive? You know, that, how, how many? These yeah. are true metrics. Uh, so, yeah. and as you say, Pantir so far is the only company that is uh, really sharing uh, these uh, tough numbers. And they're not only saying them uh, because they're cool, but also their customers are actually saying that. I believe these information actually has a lot of weight and a lot of weight that is currently not perceived. So my perception is like Palantir right now, it is not priced cheaply, like a 40x free cash flow is not cheap, but uh, I feel it is still heavily underappreciated for the real weight uh, it delivers. So far, Palantir is priced as a good company, but the weight of information that we have makes it not a good company, makes it uh, an alpha company. Yeah. And it's not clearly priced as an alpha company right now. That's my my thought. Obviously, it could be wrong. This is not financial advice. Yeah, it's the same thought that I have. And, and yet, we don't know if next week it's going to go down to 15 or 14. That's our point. Uh, the market can be irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So I'm, I'm a, a very long-term shareholder and I'm very happy that I don't have to worry about this. You know, it's just, if it's a good price and I have money, I can add. And I, I like that feeling. I feel uh, in the same way. Like uh, I like to feel in a position of power where the stock goes up. Oh, I'm happy. I'm uh, exposed enough. Stock goes down. I have uh, some cash still on the sideline ready to strike and i will not make that mistake again of those <laughs> for this time. yeah uh cool thank you so much i think this was a uh, deep value i i went a lot more into uh the weeds than i i like meaning the weeds like the nerdy stuff than i thought but i i think that's what gives the value so i hope the audience enjoyed it and uh all of arnie's um how you can reach him is in the description uh, except for your Substack, but uh, I, I will update it. Okay, you can reach yeah. it uh, directly from my ex, uh, but otherwise, <laughs> uh, palantirbullets.com, easy to find. I share uh, weekly recaps uh, and sometimes also way deeper articles. I was asked previously if uh, I'm willing to make Palantir Bullets live streams uh, again. Not in the near future. I would like to bring something uh, new, but uh, work in progress. Awesome. Awesome. Keep us posted, Arnie. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Please make sure you're subscribed and see you in the next video. Thank you and ciao, ciao.